the Right Honourable Jacob Rees-Mogg MP, the Leader of the House of Commons. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, th thank, you. thank you so much. There seems to be some enthusiasm in this hall for getting Brexit done. And I, I didn't realise there were so many members of the North East Somerset Conservative Association here <laughs> with whom I always had a little deal at, a, at fringe events, which was that if I needed a little bit of extra applause, I'll tug on my earlobe. So you're now let into the, uh, into the secret. But it's an extraordinary honour for me to be here speaking at this conference. Because like so many of you, I've belonged to this party since I was a mere youth. And I'm sorry to confess I was once a mere youth. I've sat like you in the seats in the days when conferences were held at the seaside. And I cannot tell you how pleased I am that you, the members, are once again the focus of these sessions. It was here, thank you, somebody agrees with me. Um, thank you. It was here in Manchester that Disraeli captured the essence of conservative principles in his 1872 speech at the Free Trade Hall, which lasted, out of interest, for over four hours. <laughs> Don't worry. When he set out our priorities for the Constitution and for the condition of the people, especially their health, he also noted that the audience he was addressing was of the highest intelligence, but not one that could compete with the brilliance, the luminosity of the audience in front of me today. We, we are better than Disraeli's audience. And he knew that the Conservative Party is a grassroots party. You, ladies and gentlemen, are the source of all our energy and intellectual nutrition. And it is right that you, the members, are back at the heart of our conference. And we owe you a debt of gratitude, an enormous debt, for your robustness and resolve now that the constitutional storm clouds muster over this nation. We feel a bit like Gulliver, tied down at Lilliput, tied down by a ragtag, motley collection of feeble, footling, feckless politicians, <laughs> all in desperate pursuit of a single unworthy aim to renege on the solemn promise they made to the British people and to try to cancel the largest single democratic mandate in our history. On the left, not you ladies and gentlemen, on the left, <laughs> we have Jeremy Corbyn, self-avowed Marxist, arguably the most left-wing leader the Labour Party has ever had, who has achieved the most remarkable feat of being even more unpopular on his side than on ours. Now, Mr. I, I, I never thought I'd get such applause for Jeremy Corbyn at a Tory party conference. Um, Mr. Corbyn would have the public believe that he is a man of principle. Jeremy Corbyn, a man who spent his career in the division lobbies as a Eurosceptic, with our great heroes, Ian Duncan Smith, Bill Cash and John Redwood, voting against the European Union, and his campaign for Remain. And now Corbyn's Surrender Act simply offers more confusion and delay at a cost of £250 million every week. This from the gentleman who has spent the last two years demanding an immediate general election, only now to run away from an election once it would offer to, to him as a model of Georgie Porgy, who you will remember, Georgie Porgy pudding and pie, kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, Jeremy, Qu uh, Jeremy Corbyn ran away. <laughs> he is a man who claims to have spent his entire career fighting racism, only to allow such virulent anti-Jewish racism to proliferate in the Labour Party that under his leadership, it has become the second party in this nation's history after the BNP to be formally investigated for racism. I do not believe that Jeremy Corbyn is a bad man, but he is a weak man, too weak to lead his party, certainly too weak to lead his country. And behind him there may be stronger men, like Sir Keir Starmer, poised as if Brutus, stiletto in hand, awaiting the moment to strike, Striking, of course, being something the left are quite fond of. <laughs> the supposed 
mastermind of Labour's Brexit policy, whose much vaunted helmsmanship has steered the Labour Party into the implausible straits of claiming they want to negotiate a new deal with Brussels, then to campaign against it in a referendum to remain in the European Union. That is Labour logic for you. In friendship false, implacable in hate, resolved to ruin or to rule the state. Those words were from the time of Charles II, and I think they apply to the Labour Party now. But let us not forget the middle muddle, where we have Joe Swinson, Liberal Democrat by name, but not by nature. Liberal in accepting the yoke of Brussels. Democratic, perhaps only in her own mind, as a figment of the imagination, because it is they who take the extreme position. They want to cancel Brexit entirely without giving the people a say. And then on the right, we have the in many ways admirable Nigel Farage, who sent to Brussels, I think, the finest politician we have ever sent to the European Parliament in the form of my sister. <laughs> and and I, shall, I shall report back to Annunziata that she got an even better chair than Jeremy Corbyn at the Tory party conference. However, we must not delude ourselves into thinking that a vote for the Brexit party does anything other than increase the risk of be Brexit being cancelled altogether. And then we have the Speaker. As a parliamentarian, no, listen, listen, because I'm actually going to be nice about him. But wait. <laughs> As a parliamentarian, I have been and in many ways remain a great admirer of the Speaker. He has helped MPs hold the government to account and to seek redress of grievance. But in my view, he has now flown too close to the sun. And I hope that as he comes to his retirement, he will not allow the good he has done in his earlier years to be forgotten. But his recent mistakes have, to my deepest regret as leader of the House of Commons, damaged the standing of the House in the eyes of the British public to its lowest point in modern history. So. So how can this impasse, created by Mr. Corbyn and friends who wish to cancel the referendum, be resolved? Well, it's simple. And this is a Tory party slogan that goes back to Lord Rand Randolph Churchill. We must trust the people. The people have spoken. Ladies and gentlemen, you have spoken. We are not your leaders from on high. We are your servants. And it is our responsibility to do what you have willed. Parliament has promised to do it. Over 80% of members of Parliament were elected on a promise to respect the result. And the sovereignty of Parliament does not come out of a void. It comes to Parliament from the people. Yet this Parliament is now holding the people in contempt. Ladies and gentlemen, they are holding you in contempt. So we must have a general election. It is time for a new Parliament a new egg must be laid that is not addled as this one is. We must trust the people as our opponents do not. And it is only a Conservative government led by our fantastic Prime Minister that can get Brexit done and deliver on the people's genuine priorities because Brexit is a means to an end, not an end in itself. So boosting the NHS, providing more police on the streets, creating more good school places and cutting the cost of living. So let me conclude as I started with Disraeli. Disraeli set out the glorious balance of our Constitution. That balance has been disturbed, distorted, and displaced. And it is our responsibility to restore that balance once more. And that will be done through a general election, through the good sense of our masters, the British people. very much, Jacob. Um, the next most popular question actually really does have your name written on it. Um, I think you would be the, in the best position to answer this. This question is, I believe Boris and team, team will get a good deal from the EU, but how will we get a majority in Parliament to vote for it? It is a very important question, uh, but I think the mood has changed in the country at large 
that everybody now wants to leave and start talking about other things. And I think that's true in the House of Commons as well. And I think if the DUP are happy with the deal, there'll be very few Conservatives, including those who are without the whip, who are then against a deal. And at that point, there are a number of people in other parties who think that, yes, we must now just finish this. Um, you're all great Brexiteers. You've got the fantastic posters to hold up. Thank you very much. Who here wants to stop talking about Brexit and talk about other things after 31st of October? Hands up. Well, even if I were chairman of the Labour Party conference, that motion was carried. 